Today I have the pleasure to announce and introduce my friend, um, Laura Popping. So I, through all of this, through Soul Food Salon, I met Laura. Uh, we, did a, we did a character day, was it the third one maybe? So it was maybe like three years ago. And I ran into, I, I was trying to think like, who, who do I know that could perhaps pull this off for me? And I was thinking of Laura, and I never ran into her ever, and I happened to run into her that day in front of the salon in Woodside. I'm like, oh my God, this is totally meant to be. So we met, and she, she did the salon for me that first time, which was amazing. And so we decided to bring it back this year. So this is the sixth annual Character Day Salon, it's, or Character Day. It's an international day. It's actually two days this year. It starts really tomorrow officially and Saturday, and Laura will tell us a little bit more about it. Um, but Laura is just a powerhouse. So she's a um, local, local psychotherapist. She specializes in leveraging the mind-body connection to help people tap into their potential to heal and discover more aliveness and joy. And I personally have discovered a lot of joy being her friend. Oh, so. Nice. Love you, honey. Hawk feather I found today. <laughs> Um, well, it's an honor to be standing up here, and I actually wanted to open with gratitude, um, which is a super powerful practice, and um, you know, one that I use, try to use every day. And I, I want to start by just naming my gratitude for Jeannie. I mean, you, you're the powerhouse, you're the rock star, and a lot of the salon is about kind of honoring our character strengths and seeing those and then growing them. And Jean, you have so many, um, but one I wanna name right now is just that you get it done. You, you are a visionary and there's lots of visionaries, but you take your vision and you make it happen. And it's just an honor and we're all blessed to be part of your community. And I appreciate how you're sharing it with us and, and trying to share it with even more people. And then bringing in the St. Francis Center is just really amazing. So I hope we all can support that. Um, so I light this candle in honor of, of you, Jeannie, and so many people that you know, I hope to kind of channel today. Um, and starting with many of the women in this room, I feel so blessed to be part of this community in particular. We're so lucky to have so many wise women and I learn from each of you every day. So thank you and calling in you know, the ones that can't be here today. I also wanna honor all my teachers, especially my shaman, Tom Pinksons, whose daughter, Nicole McNaughton, is a part of our community, and I'll definitely be sharing a lot of his wisdom today. And I wanna honor and thank my family. It's so special to have Jojo here. You know, I invited her. Uh, my husband was like, do you think my son's in Yosemite with the seventh grade? Um, but Jojo's here, and my, my husband was like, well, I, I think she should come. And I thought, well, okay. And I, I told her about it. I said, Jojo, do you want to come to the soul food salon that I'm doing on Thursday morning? And she said, oh, well, maybe, you know. <laughs> I was like, well, it's, you know, it's definitely more for adults. Uh, and she goes, does that mean you're going to swear a lot? <laughs> so I'll try not to swear, given that Jojo is here. I love you so much, and you are one of my biggest teachers. So, uh, and then I also want to name my husband Andy. You know, he, I, he, many of my friends have heard me say this, but he was my gift from the universe before I did my work. Uh, we met very young at Stanford, and uh, you know, he, he is somebody who inspires me every day. And again, the salon is kind of um, inspired by Character Day, which is this amazing celebration where, um, created by this powerhouse of a woman, Tiffany Schlane. She's a San Francisco filmmaker, and she, I definitely want to share her as a resource today. Um, the celebration, which is the sixth one, it starts tomorrow, it's like technically, and part of why we are doing this today is so that maybe if you're inspired, you share it with your loved ones. And I, I really think it's also especially amazing for young adults and kids to kind of tap into this concept of really focusing on character and so Tiffany's idea was like okay you know all, all, let's take one day a year where we pause and we think who do we want to be and how do we really be that person and focus on character I mean we're so distracted and, and by so many things these days and I'll, I'll speak especially to t technology because that's sort of one of the focuses of this character day um, she's actually inviting everyone to do something that her family has been doing for like 10 years or something, a while now, which is take a technology Shabbat. 
So on Saturdays, they, for 24 hours, her family doesn't use any technology, and she's written a book about it. It came out on Tuesday. So her website is on the handout, or if you just remember, characterday.org. The name of her film company is letitripple.org. She's releasing, specifically for this Character Day, two two-minute films. One's Dear Student, one's Dear Parent, or, and they're great. Um, really digestible, powerful stuff. Um, she inspires me, for sure. Um, and we're going to share one of her films today, um, and then we'll just talk a little bit more. And uh, you know, before, as I was thinking about doing this, which this is definitely an edge for me, um, to just be up here speaking, and um, I wanted to just sort of ground myself and, and name to all of you my purpose, because this is kind of what this day is about, is really focusing on who we want to be and how we get there. Um, so my purpose is to light up the world with love by reflecting the divine I see all around me and helping people be their highest self. So that's my purpose. And hopefully today I share some best practices that have supported me and some of my clients. And the other thing I wanted to name is, I, I really kind of picture this as laying out a buffet. Um, and I'm just offering things, and I ask you to kind of check in with your body and take what you want, and leave what you don't, and salt what you need to salt, and just make it work for you, which is you know, really connected to my deeper. I studied somatics, which is body-centered psychotherapy, and really builds on the power of the mind-body connection, and a lot of that is about listening, and just slowing down and checking in. And in particular, listening to our body wisdom, which is there but often ignored. So that's another invitation is even during the salon, if you need to get up and stretch and move or you're hungry, and thank you, Alana and Stacy, for the nourishment, um, you know, listen to your body because that's actually what I'm inviting you and, and what I've seen be really powerful. So on that note, we're going to show a quick film and then dive in deeper. Let's hope for the high end, 82 years. Start with a little optimism. And then if you multiply that by 365, that's around 30,000 days. 30,000 days. That's the amount of days that you hopefully have here on this earth. 30,000 days. 30,000 days. 30,000 days. 30,000 days. 30,000 days. 30,000 days. We'll play well, Rosie. 20 jours. There are a lot of ways you could spend those days. What do you want to contribute to the world? What do you want to do that you haven't done? What gives your life purpose? So how are you going to spend your days? Humans have been wrestling with these questions about how to live a good, purposeful life contributing to something larger than ourselves throughout all of history and across all cultures. And every era has faced these questions in different ways, depending on what was happening in the world, what the world was asking of them. And in today's world, we certainly have a lot of things we need to address. but we're also living in an unprecedented period of connectivity, access to knowledge and culture. So many more ways to contribute to the world. So what's the world asking of us right now? And what's the world asking of you? Ah, hi, it's a tough one. <laughs> Not the easiest questions. So in order to help us out, let's take a journey back through history to see how other eras have addressed them. Here we are in the 6th century BC. That's about 2,500 years ago. Humanity was going through some growing pains. It was a time of conflicting ideas about government, power, and religion. That led to fierce battles across the known world. Sound familiar? But something extraordinary was also happening. In cultures around the globe, all beginning around the same time, Philosophies emerged that were all about helping humans find a sense of meaning and purpose. 
In Greece, for example, philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle believed the good life would come from developing character and contributing to society. And in East Asia, Chinese philosophers were flourishing with what's known as the Hundred Schools of Thought. Hundreds of different schools of thought on how to live a fulfilling and purposeful life. Confucianism, for example, taught about the importance of cultivating the five constants, benevolence, justice, propriety, wisdom, and integrity. It was as if the world at the time, across all cultures, was requiring humanity to step up amidst the conflict and work harder at being a good person. These ideas emerged from so many different cultures around the same time that the era would later be known as the Axial Age, a pivotal era in history where old ideas no longer worked and new thinking was needed. We see the rise of Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, and Christianity. Very different ideologies, but at the core, talking about the same thing, being good and doing good. Like I grew up hearing about the ancient Jewish philosopher Hulal, who pretty much said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole Torah, the rest is commentary. And in Christianity, it was love thy neighbor as thyself. And Confucius taught, don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. I love the simplicity and the commonality. Fast forward to the Middle Ages, a period that lasted roughly a thousand years. There was mass migration across much of Europe and more growing pains. Populations rose and fell, empires rose and fell. New technologies brought new trade between regions, but increased mobility also carried disease along with it. Towards the end of the Middle Ages in Europe, we see widespread famine, plague, and revolts. But we also see more and more ideas about living life with meaning and purpose. Throughout this whole period, for example, which is centuries after the Axial Age, we see the rise and spread of Islam with its five pillars rooted in developing character strengths like humility, self-control, and compassion. These ideas spreading from so many different sources. And then another great shift happened, the Enlightenment. Huge discoveries across scientific disciplines from astronomy to math to medicine gave order to what was once unruly and unexplainable. It wasn't much later that Darwin's theory of evolution further shook people's foundational assumptions about life. This new era of science and discovery also shifted formal education. In the past, educational systems had largely been housed in religious institutions. But this new emphasis on science shifted curriculum to combine lessons of character and values together with the academic subjects. Oh, hey, Maria Montessori. And then something interesting happened. More and more respect for cultural diversity in different religions, or none, led some governments, including the United States, to separate church and state, which was great for so many reasons. But it also meant that in government-funded public schools, character and values were considered too religious to teach. Character education fell out of public schools for over 50 years. Until the end of the 20th century, scientific research emerged about the importance of teaching and developing character, including one groundbreaking study that looked throughout history to identify character strengths and virtues that are universally valued across all cultures. And character education has been making its way back into the mainstream ever since. And we need it. We need more character across all parts of society, from political debates, boardrooms and schools, to on our screens and at our dinner tables. It's as if the world is asking us once again to step up refocus on what we value both as individuals and as a society, and work harder at living life with meaning and purpose. In fact, renowned scholar Karen Armstrong calls this next chapter, the new axial age. 
So what does that look like for you? What's the world asking of you in your 30,000 days? So let's try something. Think of your unique special sauce, the things that make you, you, the qualities that you value. And then think about what gets you most excited, passionate. What's that thing or that issue that you care so much about? And then think, how can I bring my personal strengths to the thing I'm most passionate about, to the change I want to see in the world? That's purpose. I get a sense of purpose from feeling like the work that I do contributes to advancing society, advancing women. Family. Family. The purpose of me being a farmer, how the people know what they're getting? It's kind of a lifelong journey to figure that out. Asking questions. Or growing other people. Be able to mean something in someone else's life. The arts, loving my fiance. Not only uh, share my truth, but then to liberate and maybe facilitate someone sharing their own truth. What I want to contribute to the world is a school that inspires and prepares change makers. And finding that purpose, regardless of when in life you find it, can have extraordinary benefits. Scientific research shows that feeling a sense of purpose reduces stress, depression, dementia, substance abuse, and even can lead to a longer and happier life. And the key to all of this goes back to ideas humans have been talking about for nearly 3,000 years, focusing on and cultivating character, a sense of who you are and what you value. Because things are gonna come at you in life from all directions, good and bad, that might shift what brings you that sense of purpose. But your character strengths are at the core. There are your resources to call upon to help navigate a future that's unknown. While it may seem like we're facing more complex problems today than we have in the past, if we look back through history, we can see these times as an invitation to step up and focus on what really matters. So how are you going to spend your 30,000 days? for this woman, right? So please use her as a resource in whatever way you're called to do. Um, that's actually one of her longer films. She has other ones that are shorter. And another thing I want to mention that's on the website, and I'll refer to a little bit, is she, she created this periodic table of character strengths, kind of playing off the periodic table. And you can go on her website to see it, and you can even click on each one, um, and it gives you some ideas for growing them. So it, it's it's pretty amazing. She definitely inspires me. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's been really present as I have been thinking about getting to do this, in addition to my gremlins, which are like, are you really, you know, able to stand up there and do this? And who are you to be talking about? You know, how do you be your best self? And truthfully, over the last weeks, I've had a lot of opportunity to kind of practice that. And one thing I want to bring forward today is, you know, tools and concrete practices around how do you be your best self, especially when the waves are crashing, especially when it's a little bit challenging, right? And a lot of it is actually about tapping into your resources and your strengths. And the other thing that, I mean, probably somewhat for me just because of the work that I do, but this week was super present. A uh, community member who's actually in the room was involved in an accident. Um, Jane and you know in a moment she ended up having to go to the hospital and she's fine but it was a reminder to me and certainly a lot of people in our community that it's like in an instant things can change and I really know that we're called to 
be present and and make the most of every moment. And you know, uh, that was really clear. And I'm so glad you're okay. <laughs> um, and another thing we'll talk about is just those challenges in life and how those are often also often the places we learn the most and the, the biggest gifts. And um, yeah, just those reminders that we only have one wild and precious life. I love Mary Oliver. Um, she passed away this year, but this, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life is, is a question that I hold dear. So um, today we'll talk about how you make use of that. You know, I, I started with this concept of gratitude, and it's a big part of, you know, how I stay connected to being positive. And as our tech team knows, you know, I, we were grappling with my necklaces, and one of the things that I do every day is I put on my gratitude lantern, and this amazing jewelry artist, creator, Jen Pleasance, is in the room with us. And if you ever need a gift, go to showthelove.com, and you will find <laughs> the most inspiring jewelry armor, because to me, that's what it is. Uh, um, that you know will support you in being your best self. So I wear my gratitude lantern, which is sort of flipping the magic lantern concept on its head, where you know you rub it and and wish for things you don't have. Well, the gratitude lantern is something that you can wear and rub and remember what you have. And you know, for me, I started wearing it at a really challenging time. My mom was in the hospital; I was dealing a lot with a lot. And yet, you know, I I'm so blessed with so much. And so to put this on every day and sort of ground in that is so powerful. So thank you for that and so many other talisman. And truly, check out Show the I should have put her website on here, but hopefully you'll remember showthelove.com because it's an incredible resource. And you know, I invite you throughout the talk to kind of think about what are daily practices that you can do that help you be who you want to be. And you know, as simple as putting on a necklace or a bracelet, some of my clients who are dealing with addiction issues will just wear a rubber band. And every time they trigger, they get a craving, you know, they snap it. So it's a, it's a way of, you know, kind of shifting your body um, and the power of that. So let's actually do a little experiential for a second. I invite you to just sort of feel your feet on the floor. This will be real quick. Um, but just sort of check in, and if you had to rate your mood zero to 10, I really like rating because it's like, it, it, it's concrete, it kind of tells you if things are, are shifting. So if you had to rate your mood zero to 10, 10 being you have reached enlightenment and ecstasy, zero, you know, you're thinking dark, dark thoughts. Um, go ahead and give yourself a number. Good, okay. And then I want you to take a second and just think about something you have in your life to be grateful for. And a lot of things might pop, or just one, that's fine. Whatever comes forward, comes forward. But think about how blessed you are to have that in your life. Think about how it supports you in being who you want to be. And let your body really feel that as a resource, wherever you feel it. And then take a second and open your eyes and look around this room. Look at Jeannie, who brings us so much. And think about just in this room what we have to be grateful for. So much, right? Yeah. And then go ahead and check in again, and, and let's do another rating. If you had to rate your mood in this moment, what number would you, would you give it, 0 to 10? And then just show of hands, whose number went up? Yeah, even if it's a little bit. Cool, awesome. So that's a, that's a, a technique um, that I find very powerful. And one of the things I'm fascinated is, uh, by is the neuropsych research that sort of proves the power of some of these sort of mind-body tools. And there's actually great research around gratitude and the power of it, even if we don't share it with people. And then it like, actually compounds if you share it with someone. And so one of the things is I brought some um, cards outside if you're compelled to take one and just write a letter of thanks to someone in your life. And you know, it might be somebody in your family, you can tuck it in someone's backpack or you can you know, put a stamp on it and mail it out or you know, invitation to 
give it to somebody that you, you haven't maybe said thank you to. Um, and just notice how it makes you feel. And then, of course, it's going to make the other person feel good, too. So please grab a letter on the way out, if you like. When a client comes to me to do some work, um, you know, I, most of my clients are coming because they're in, in some kind of crisis or something really difficult has happened, although I do have some people who are coming just for, like, support them and being their best self, which is always really fun work. Um, but we, we start, and I, I tell them, you know, basically, I'm going to ask you to do two things if we work together. And the first is to be curious. And almost like a child who picks up a rock and shoves it in their mouth. I mean, really, like, let's just drop the judgment and get curious and think about how things are working for you. And notice, simply notice, without judgment. And I really appreciated the St. Francis Center I saw. You know, it said, compassion, not judgment. And it's super powerful. And I find that, you know, Compassion is amazing. Sometimes it takes that concept of curiosity to get people to drop the judgment, to get to the compassion place. Um, so invitation to use that concept of curiosity. And again, with like young adults and, and kids, it, it's a good one to just say, huh, how's that working for you? <laughs> you know, tell me about that. Really and truly, tell me about that. You know? um, so curiosity, and then the other one is kindness which sounds easy, but is often kind of the, the harder step. Um, Pema Chodron, who the handout that I gave you has a number of quotes from her. She's an amazing woman. I especially um, use the book When Things Fall Apart as a resource. But she has a great quote about kindness. She says, be kinder to yourself, and then let your kindness flood the world. So I thought that was just beautiful. So we're going to be curious and kind. and. As we're trying to be kind of our best selves and who we want to be, unfortunately, sometimes there are things that get in the way. And again, you know, one of the blessings of my work is getting to kind of help people look at that w without judgment, with compassion, and get curious and say, huh, you know, what is getting in the way of me being my best self? And in psychology, um, it, this concept of survival strategies or organizing patterns I've found is super powerful. So when you kind of drop in and you notice like, oh, I'm doing something and start to get curious about why and really looking at, you know, where did that come from? So a lot of times we, you know, one of the reasons we call it a survival strategy is when we're young, we often comes, come up with ways of being in the world that are really the best we can do kind of in our setting when we're young and we don't have as much power. But then as we become adults and we have a lot more choice, and a lot of this presentation is actually going to be about getting clear that we have choice all the time, um, it's super helpful to say, like, oh, you know, back in the day, I, I thought that I had to, you know, do everything or I had to um, be a certain way. And you know, there, there's this concept of limited thinking patterns. Um, and that'll kind of, well, I guess I'll drop into the gremlin parties. And Jean, as we were making this PowerPoint, she's like, gremlin parties, what are those? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, you'll find out. Um, but gremlins, uh, it, it's a technique that I got from a psychologist, Rick Carson. He has a book called Taming Your Gremlin. And it's really just kind of a more playful way of talking about that self-critic, those negative, judgmental thoughts the, that often are running in the background. Um, and I, I like the concept of gremlins because it kind of externalizes it and it makes it kind of fun and playful. And, and especially when we're dealing with kind of challenging things, the more you can you know, make it a little playful, it, it's easier to deal with. So I invite my clients to notice throughout the day, you know, they're gremlins. And we all have them. <laughs> we, so some of us, you, know, you might have 20, you might have one super loud one. Um, but just kind of getting curious about those inner critic voices that pop up and aren't maybe very helpful for um, who you want to be. But usually the gremlins grew out of a survival strategy, a way of trying to be in the world. And what I, what I share with clients is, you know, gremlins, are, they basically come and they knock on your door. Like, doot, 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 you know, they're just sort of starting, like a niggling thought. Um, and if you use mindfulness and awareness, and you say, oh, there's that gremlin. Okay, it's showing up because guess what? Right now I'm 
nervous or I'm hungry or I'm tired or I'm angry and when I'm angry that gremlin that says oh you can't feel things or whatever whatever the gremlin is pops up but the sooner you can notice it the easier it is to shut it down um, but what gremlins want to do is throw a party so th they want to knock on the door they want to come in they want to text all their friends and next thing you know you know it's it, it, they're swinging from chandeliers and um, it's a lot harder. So kind of the, the analogy of if you fall down the hole, you know, the sooner you can kind of catch yourself, the easier it is. So just big invitation to use mindfulness, um, to notice those voices. And, you know, if this speaks to you, I invite you to kind of think about, you know, what are, if you can get concrete about what are some of the, the messages you get from the gremlins, it'll be a lot easier to spot them when they show up. Um, this, you know, and, and gremlins, <laughs> they're classic. A lot of gremlins are supporting these kind of negative, limited thinking patterns. And there's some kind of 12 basic ones, and you, you probably know a lot of them, but I'll just quickly name like overgeneralizing, black and white thinking, catastrophizing, all or nothing, predicting the future. So, so kind of voices like that. Um, who in here recognizes that they might have gremlins every now and then? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, anyone feel comfortable sharing a gremlin voice that they'd like to kind of notice quicker and not let in? You should do this. Oh, shoulds, right? Don't should yourself. Right, good. Anyone else want to name one? You can't do it right. Oh, perfectionism. Yeah, yeah, right. And I just feel the weight of it, right? And, and um, again, if we can start to kind of see them as gremlins and like, oh, get out of here, you know, kind of make it light. It can be really helpful. Okay, gremlins, heavy stuff, but super important um, and powerful. And, you know, as I was getting ready for today, so back to kind of concrete practices that support who you want to be in addition to you know, armoring up, and you'll hear about my sparkles. I definitely use, um, you know, various books, and I have some of them out on the table. And this is a book that my shaman put out with different mantras. And as I was getting ready specifically for this moment, this morning, I opened it up, and it was, what gets in the way is the way, <gasps> right? And again, that that's a lot of sort of my work and how I support people in looking like, okay, yeah, that definitely, you know, got in the way, but how do we mine it for gifts and how do we learn and grow from it? Um, so I just love too synchronicity and, you know, Jean spoke to our earlier run-in, but I feel like as you tap in, uh, um, it happens more and more uh, that you sort of get messages of support because you're open to them because you're looking for them so it happens a lot when I open my various mantra books that I get exactly what I need um, the one the other one that has been super up for me is um, some of you know I'm dealing with this kind of nighttime arm itching which is driving me nuts and and I, I keep going back to my Louise Hay, Louis Hay, Louise Hay book and over and over again the mantra I get is I listen to my body symptoms with love and I, I often just like want to rip it up. <laughs> but then I try to actually stick it like right where my toothbrush is and, and say it and listen with love. So, you know, powerful stuff. And again, an invitation to kind of find the things. Oh, I'm supposed to be in the blue lines, huh? Find the things that, that support you and put them around your house, right? Have books, have candles that support you in tapping into who you want to be. So awareness equals choice. This, this is the equation I overuse, but it's right there, right? And, and it's speaking to the power of mindfulness. But once we're aware, we get to be in choice. Oh, here I'm thinking that. Do I want to continue thinking that or kind of shift it? Really powerful. Again, I, I think I mentioned I studied somatic psychology, which is body-centered psychotherapy. And I was drawn to it when it was still really progressive. There were only three accredited programs in the country, two in California and one in Boulder. Um, so grateful for living in an area that's really progressive and on the cutting edge of things. And this was sort of the cutting edge of psychology, where they were starting to, instead of um, doing the Western sort of dual mind-body separation, where it's all about sort of cognitive psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy, 
really starting to honor that the mind and the body are interconnected. And how do we, you know, where I take it is how do we actually first honor that and then second leverage it. So really uh, knowing that there are times where, <laughs> the other quote I say all the time is, if you can change your thoughts, change your thoughts. <laughs> you know, so like people come to me and, you know, okay, <laughs> oh, have you tried cognitive behavioral therapy? Like, <laughs> like yep, <laughs> you know, I've tried changing my thoughts. <laughs> and, and absolutely, that's where it begins. Like it begins with awareness. It begins with noticing the thoughts that are not working as well as the thoughts that do work. But when you notice the thoughts that aren't working and you want to change them and you can't, the body is a back door. And a lot of what I work with is people who are dealing with trauma responses, anxiety responses, uh, really deep depression, where truthfully, and this is again where the neuroscience supports the fact that they cannot access their frontal cortex. When you're in a panic attack, you actually can't get to that part of your brain that's able to change your thoughts. You're in your early brain. And so you can use your body to then shift things. And kind of back to the buffet model, um, I, I really want to offer some ideas that I found really helpful for people. And some of them are pretty simple. You know, obviously you have the breath, right? Which if you can tap into the power of the inhale and the exhale, it'll calm you down. It'll engage your parasympathetic nervous system if you can deep belly breathe. Um, it's an amazing resource. I love the, just even tapping into the energy of, you know, inhaling what you want to inhale and exhaling whatever you're done with. Um, so actually, maybe we'll do that for a second right now. Yeah, it's like, okay. So just go ahead and feel your feet on the floor again. <coughs> and begin to notice your breath. There's no, no need to change it, although often when we bring our attention to the breath, it naturally deepens. But just start with simply noticing. Yeah. And connecting with that inhale and exhale. And as you connect with it, begin to remember the power of bringing in new energy, bringing in new life force, oxygen, chi. And as you bring it in with the inhale, it goes throughout your body, nourishing, energizing all parts of you. So just go ahead and, and really kind of notice that set the intention that it's moving throughout your body, going in energizing areas that you especially need energized. And then with each exhale, remember it's an opportunity to get rid of things, to let things go, anything you're done with. And again, kind of set that intention. If there's something you're needing to release or let go with each exhale, it's an opportunity to do so. And again, you know, go ahead and even with the inhales, if there's something you want to take in specifically in addition to just the chi, the energy that comes naturally with every breath, but you want to bring in relaxation, you want to bring in peace, you want to bring in joy, go ahead and give it a name. And with your inhale, picture bringing that in. And with each exhale, making space, letting go, so you have more room to bring in whatever it is you want to bring in. Oh, the power of the breath. It's there for us every moment. Something you can do anytime, anywhere. You know, what I, there, I read Nelson Mandela's autobiography, and he talked about some of the punishments on Robben Island, and um, you know, they're awful, um, really awful. And um, <coughs> I'll never forget one of the things he talked about is they actually would dig a hole, and he would have to be in a hole you know, on this island in the African sun, and they would do horrible things. Uh, the guards would urinate, you know, it was just awful. And he, he said how he got through it was tapping into his breath. And knowing that, you know, why they could do all these things to him, they could never touch his breath. So that power, right, that's there for us everywhere.
even in a setting like that is pretty amazing. So much gratitude for our like a miraculous body. So the other thing I, I use a lot as a somatic therapist is just really honoring the miracle of our body. And we have like all this understanding and science that points to amazing things. And then there's the spirit piece of like, you know, and, and even the best Stanford cardiologist doesn't fully understand why the heart keeps beating, right? Each moment that, it, that, it, there, that it, there'll be a time where it, it does just stop. Um, and tapping into that miracle of your heartbeat, the miracle of your breath is very powerful stuff. So invitation to use the body. Um, the other thing I kind of want to say is, is that, you know, especially with anxiety, and I see so much anxiety in my practice these days, and I actually directly link it to technology, which we'll kind of get to. But, um, you know, when people are really in an anxious place, it's, it's tough to deep breathe. I feel like you're often asking someone to go from like 85, 90 to, <laughs> right? A and again, if you can deep belly breathe, do it because it works. Uh, but often I find that you need something a little bit more active first. So some of the practices that I like, it really depends on your setting, right? If you're at home, you have the freedom to go for a quick run or a walk, and that's super powerful. Getting outside is something that's really powerful, just stepping outside. Um, grounding, getting your feet on the earth. Um, but if you're in a classroom or at a, uh, an event where you, know, you can't just go and go for a run, there's a powerful technique called progressive muscle relaxation where you tense your body as, as much as you can and then release. And it's one, again, if you're at home, you can squeeze away. But if, if you're in a setting like this, you can actually do it kind of on the sly, like I'm doing it right now and it's not super obvious. So go ahead, I invite you if you want to just kind of squeeze your muscles. You can do it really hard, you know, once. And then release and release again. So the, the idea is you squeeze and then two levels of releasing. And um, I love that it's a sneaky one too, that it's one you can kind of do. Like everybody right now, try to do it without being obvious that you're doing it. The legs come into play there where you're kind of squeezing your thighs and your butt and your arms, you know, <laughs> right? But it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, and then go ahead and release and release again. And if you're sitting, you know, let yourself really be supported, connecting with the chair and letting it support you. So I love tense and release. It's a really powerful one that you can use. The other one that I, I use that, um, a lot with clients, I call fast feet because of <clears throat> you see those football players and people in sports running up and down like this. So that's a really powerful one. And in 30 seconds, you can really change your body state. Of course, it's one that you, you might need to go to the bathroom to do or <laughs> something like that. But fast feet is a really powerful technique as well. As we're talking about this, I guess I really want to ground that emotions are sensations. So back to that kind of mind-body concept, emotions are actually a body state. So how do you know you're happy? How do you know you're sad? It's actually a body state. And as we develop more awareness around that, we have more ability to, to work with it. I talk about emotions are waves. They come and they go. And how do you surf those waves? And some of the practices that we're talking about will help you be a more kind of agile surfer. Um, but it's just that concept too that emotions are gonna come and go that's really powerful. As I work with people who are you know, dealing with issues like suicidality, reminding them that emotions are waves and just without judgment, dropping in and studying that wave, noticing what it feels like in your body and how do you work with it. And then with some of the bigger waves, it's also important to know that you, know, you don't surf every wave, right? So if, if you're in a setting where it doesn't make sense to surf the wave, it's also, okay, how do you, you know, turn turtle? How do you kind of distract or ground? And then eventually, I think you know, it's super helpful to kind of come back and, and let emotions run through your body. Um, but feeling just more capable, more powerful around your emotional waves, I think really helps us be who we want to be. So speaking of that, <laughs> I said, Jean and I were, PowerPoint is not my strength. And, and of course, Jean comes over, was that just Monday? And, and I hadn't gotten to the PowerPoint yet. And, she, and again, this is like G, one of Jean's amazing gifts and strengths. And she's like, well, let's do it. Do you got a computer? I'm like, I guess I got a computer. You know, we sat down and boom, in 24 hours. 
Um, but what, late night, Monday or Tuesday, I sent her this image to add in. She goes, wow. <laughs> so what was your response? <laughs> but you know I needed something for unique gifts and talents, and I think she's got one for sure, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, okay, well, unique guests. So, you know, as we start to kind of get the gremlins out of the way, um, one of the things that actually really supports us in living our best life is thinking about, you know, who, who we are and what we bring to the world. I love this theorist, James Hillman. Uh, he talks about something called the acorn theory. So just the truth that in an acorn is an entire oak tree. And each of us came into the world as an acorn with a beautiful oak tree in us and kind of thinking about, all right, you know, what is unique to me? And, you know, how do I honor that? Um, the character table of character strengths can be helpful if you're, you know, kind of thinking, all right, who, you know, what are my unique gifts and strengths? And, you know, big invitation to think about those today and kind of honor those. And I love that before, I don't know if you guys all saw the email that Jean sent out, and this is on your website, right? This is amazing, the concept of ikigai and really kind of identifying, all right, what do I love? What am I passionate about? What am I good at? What comes naturally to me? What can I be rewarded for? And what does the world need? and the intersection of those things. So beautiful. Love it. And, and I think sharing that with our children early on, right, is so powerful. So one of the things is also like tracking for what, where do we feel the best? Where do we feel alive and joyful? And that'll also help you kind of identify your strengths. I want you to take a moment, and again, you know, if you're comfortable kind of closing your eyes or averting your gaze, and thinking about what are your unique gifts or talents? Something that comes natural to you, that lights you up, that you love doing, that you feel passionately about. And also something that's unique to you. Maybe one, two, three kind of adjectives or character strengths that come naturally, but you also want to grow. And then when you have them come back to the room, and again, invitation, would someone share theirs with us? Stacy, what you got? <laughs> I said um, honesty, passion, and love. Who else is willing to share? Because this is part of it, right? It's like identifying what your strength is and then sharing it with the world. I see climbing trees. Oh, yeah. Just like getting up in nature. I see you doing that, Kathleen. Yeah. Love it. It's an awesome strength. Who else? Yeah, please. Optimism, um, connections, and Honesty. Beautiful. Can you speak to the connection strength? How do you do that? Uh, connecting with people, yeah. whether I know them or not. Yeah. I guess on top of that, I let people know they're seeing. So powerful. You're good at seeing. Yeah. In, in a supermarket, to the workers, to everybody around, I let them know they're seeing. That's an amazing strength. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Um, bringing you in. Beautiful. Well, and uh, you know that gift of, you know, really truly knowing and sharing that it's it's through mistakes that we learn and grow, right? That's uh, think about the young kid learning to walk. They they stumble. That that's part of the process, um, and so there's so much power in in honoring that. Um, and I think I, with the young adults, I see a lot of the work is reminding them <laughs> that, look, you don't have to be perfect. This is how you learn and grow. So as we identify our strengths, 
an invitation to kind of craft it into how you want to be in the world, right? What's your purpose? What's your intention statement? And one thing I've learned, especially from working with my, my shaman, is the power of you know, having a, an intention statement, saying it daily, sometimes eight times a day, sometimes 18 times a day. And actually, this is perfect because JoJo's going to go back to school. But um, will you share Tomas's intention statement for kind of everyone that he does? So when, when I go on retreats with him, if you, before you speak, he wants everybody to ground in truth. And so he gives you this intention statement to say that's true for all of us. And then you, you know, can create your personal one. But we use it a lot in our family. You don't need to read it. Just Anyone? say it. <laughs> you, Jojo made this for our altar at home. Yeah. I so, miss, yeah, go for it. What are you? I am a sacred, worthy, luminous being. I am love and my love is forgiven. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to class? Yeah. So I love that, right? Um, I am a sacred, worthy, luminous being. I am love, and my love is forgiving. And you know, when I start, first started working with him, I wasn't sure if it was one word, right? <laughs> and it's on your sheet. It's on your sheet. Um, or if it was two words. And, and I think there's actually, I mean, I've talked to him about it, it's, it's very conscious, because forgiveness actually is such an incredible practice that helps us be more open to love. So just take a second. I mean, I feel like this is so powerful. And um, as I've worked with him and watched other people work with him, you know, just saying this and noticing kind of where you get stuck, noticing what you have trouble with, right? Like, am I worthy? Am I sacred? Don't always feel that, but guess what? You are, you know. Um, powerful, powerful statement. Hmm. You know, and it's, it's really uh, powerful to just kind of say it to yourself, and then it's also super powerful to kind of share it with another person. Um, Tom Pinkson, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you could turn to your neighbor and just take turns saying it, and just you know play, be playful with it. I know it's kind of intense, but we're <laughs> we're dropping in. Can I do it with you. Yes, I'll be your neighbor. I am a sacred. Yes, you are. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. How was it? Hard. Hard sometimes. Yeah, hard sometimes. Yeah, thank you for your honesty, right? How was it? Julie, how was it? Yeah, felt good. Yeah. Well, it's on your, it's on your sheet. Play with it. A and then... Um, I guess the other thing I want to share that supports me is what I call an everyday spirituality. So just really, you know, as I go throughout my day, a lot of it is supported by kind of this practice of sensory awareness and kind of being in my senses and noticing things and noticing things in nature, especially for me. Um, but I find that one of the things that helps me be my best self is, you know, seeing the sacred all around me in the flower, in the friend, kind of in the sunlight, um, so kind of invitation to do that. One resource that's been super powerful for me as I've been kind of thinking about, you know, purpose is getting really clear uh, that I can't do it all. <laughs> I, I like to, especially I specialize in working with adolescents, and uh, I think one of my strengths with them is that I keep it real. <laughs> I don't just say, drugs are bad, you know, certainly some are all bad. Um, but I'm real honest about things. And essentialism, just as a, as a practice, has been super powerful for me, and especially the part of keeping it real that I can't do everything, that I do need to kind of focus in and leverage, again, sort of my unique strengths and talents, and how do I share them with the world, knowing that I can't do everything. And one of the, I don't think this is actually on your handout, but one of the, 
his Greg McCowan, who's at Stanford, um, you know, he says, if it's not a resounding yes, then it's a no. And that's been so helpful for me, <laughs> right? Sort of like, you know, wow, okay. Um, getting clear, and, and I love this image from the book, right? Like sort of, you know, you can try to do everything, but you maybe aren't gonna have the same kind of reach, the same impact, versus getting clear on you know, really how you want to focus your energies. Um, one, <laughs> another practice that I've had, I noticed myself a couple years ago in my mind, I, I had a busy gremlin, a gremlin that was constantly like, oh, you're so busy, you have so much to do. <laughs> Which I, you know, I sort of did, and at the same time, part of essentialism is about realizing I choose that. I have each moment I get to choose. I mean, th th and, and to, you know, really want to speak actually to privilege. Like, we do have so much privilege just being who we are and where we are that we do get to choose. You know, we aren't having to walk to get the water. Um, we get to choose what we do with our day. And being really clear and honest with ourselves about that. And also relating to what you're doing a a as, a, as a blessing. And so, a couple of years ago, I started a practice of trying to notice when I caught myself with that busy gremlin being like, oh, you got so much to do. So reframing it and saying, wow, I am so blessed to have so many things in my life that I care about. I am so blessed. What do I want to focus on now? Right? So that's sort of one of my mantras, and I especially grab it the second I notice that busy gremlin, that overwhelm is, wow, I'm so lucky to have so much I want to do today. What am I going to focus on? And, and it, you know, also it's like such a gift to remember that we get to choose. We can't do it all. That's okay, <laughs> right? And and I did on my altar up here. I did bring in my office. I keep a um, oxygen mask, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I use this metaphor a lot with clients. And I told a flight attendant one time about it, and she gave me the oxygen mask. <laughs> Yeah, um, so this is just that concept that's super important to remember that, you know, whatever we want to give to the world, first we got to make sure that we're putting our oxygen mask on, you know, a and especially for mothers, that can be really tough because we would, you know, throw ourselves in front of the bus for our kids. Um, but the reality is if we don't resource, we can't help people, we can't do what we want to do. And so th this was one of the biggest gifts for me. You know, before I became a mother, b uh, before I became a mother, you know, I was already kind of doing this work with clients, and um, it's been such a gift to remember, just in life, that the more you resource, the more you have to give. And I think uh, essentialism for me is also kind of really it, it sits next to it because it helps me remember. All right, like I can't do it all. What do I want to focus on? So picture your oxygen mask. And, and then the big thing is thinking about like what are those things that resource you, that really help you fill up. This year's character day was really focusing on how does technology support my character and who I want to be in the world? How does it detract? And it's such an important question because technology is everywhere. It's so addicting. It's designed to be addicting. Um, and it's really important to bring in mindfulness around that. That, to me, is the antidote. So, you know, big invitation, and as Jean mentioned, one of the ideas for this character day is to take Saturday and actually do a technology Shabbat with your family, and, and, or yourself first, um, and just kind of see how that feels. And as many of you know, you know I, I specialize in working with adolescents, and what I'm seeing with these young adults who've been really raised on tech is a huge impact, and especially around their ability to sort of emotionally regulate, and um, it's, it's something we're not doing a good job educating people about, just how impactful technology is, and especially when it's, you know, with young adults, influencing them all the time. And it's really important to support people around putting in place structures that help you use technology in a way that helps, that really supports who you want to be. And, and everyone's different around this, but really kind of thinking about, all right, yeah, sure, 
Sometimes technology, it helps me connect with people and inspires me. It gives me access to resources. Go hop on the Soul Food Salon website and get a, re a recipe. Like it's amazing, right? And it's really important not to demonize technology, but to, to be conscious. Um, so in here, who wants to share a way they use technology that supports them being who they want to be? Awesome. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Audio books. Oh, yeah. Lucky us, right? You get to... Looking at volunteer opportunities. Awesome. Can you think? Emailing with family and friends who are too far away to see. Right. And I mean, one thing I see with my clients who go off to college, I mean, when I came out to California from Georgia, I'd maybe talk to my parents like once a month on a pay phone. Like it was, right? And now the kids, they're really connected to, the, but it's amazing how we can stay connected, right? And to people all over the world. Yeah. Learning how to do something. Oh, yeah, how cool is that, right? You can watch a video about, yeah. Yeah. So the learning to stay connected piece, or, or, so for me, Facebook, which I know has its pluses and minuses, but I'm sitting here in a row behind one of my old high school best friends who I haven't seen in 15, 20 years, but we are connected on Facebook. And so I know that we're still the same people we were and that we actually have more in common today than we probably did back then. Wow. And we just literally bumped into each other. Uh, uh, yay, so cool. Connection, awesome. Cool. Anyone want to share how they feel like technology actually distracts them or keeps them from, yeah? Um, web surfing and reading the news yeah. definitely spins my mind up and distracts me from moving forward in that. Ditto. Ditto. Yeah. 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 So before I left my job, there was this expectation from my CEO that like you're always on like, hours a day. because you you're always with your phone whereas 10 years ago that was not the case and now everyone ex is expected to just be available whenever you get the text or the email or whatever so it just it extends the working day through your weekend through your evening through like 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons I love my job it's just crazy. I leave my car my phone in the car when I'm working and I only look at my email in the mornings and the nights. Nice. So I don't, I just like. Have a, you have a structure in place yeah. that, yeah, supports you. And, and this is where everyone gets to create their own. You, There's. You don't answer your email or your text. Yeah, <laughs> it's only, yeah. Actually, she's pretty attentive and, and responds when. Well, there's also something about focused attention, right? Versus like checking it all the time and then you realize you forgot them. I mean, I'm definitely guilty of that where I checked my text, but I didn't have time to respond and then I forget that it was there because it's, you know, doesn't have the dot and blah, <laughs> right? Um, so last year I lost um, access to my phone for 31 days. Wow. Through it, which was complicated reason why. But it was really interesting because what it does is it, forces you to look around and it, like for example my husband and I were in the airport and there were you know 90 percent of the people oh, were on their phones or yes. weren't interacting with each other and it, what it does is it gives you perspective and you look around the room or the world and see you know people walking down the street or yeah. things like that they just have um, yeah they're just distracted but they're not interacting with each other so there's such loneliness there and what I what I saw mm -hmm. is true loneliness well, I find too that people, you have to be so responsive um, that, especially with young children, um, there was a, a, this is just an example, something changed about a year ago, um, like a pickup or just a teacher wasn't there for an after school sport and I didn't have my phone with me. And I came back to my phone and I was the only one who had not responded. And I felt horrible. I mean, it was probably a two-hour time span, and they, at least for my village, boy, I took me home, and it was all good. But it was this, and, and so from that incident now, I feel like I always have to have my phone, because what if something changes, and I didn't respond, or whatever. I'm usually one with my phone, but that was just an example.
And yet back in the day when things like that happened, right, the kids figured it out. They walked home. They had an adventure, right? Like, and sort of what we're missing because of that, I think, is actually really powerful. I, I again, specialize in young adults, and I have a number of clients who end up taking a gap year, which I'm a big fan of for a lot of reasons for some people in between high school and college. And some of them go to really, like, remote places, South America, Africa. And it's so interesting when they come back. I mean, obviously, very transformative experience but they all speak to the power of like the time that they had to sit on the bus from their home to where they were going and, and just having that space because they don't have that here because of phones as well as busyness, you know, dry, going to this event and that tutor and this coach and this specialist and da, 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 right? So just like creating more space. And then to your point about connectivity, and one thing I ask people to track and invite you to track around technology is, yes, it's amazing for connection. And we're so lucky that we can you know, text and connect. And make sure you're checking in. What's the quality of connection? Is this actually, you know, what's the quality here? And uh, more than anything, use your phones to then meet up, right? That is, especially my advice with young people, it's like, wow, it's amazing, but use your phone to then, I mean, they'll waste six hours snapping about stupid stuff versus get together and connect and talk. And again, the research really shows that there's a big difference uh, um, and much more beneficial. Another quote I overuse, and speaking to kind of one of the challenges with technology, especially social media tends to um, do, you know, be a thief of joy. So comparison is the thief of joy. If you're on Instagram, enjoy looking at your friends wherever, but don't be comparing. That's definitely not going to make you happy. Can I share a favorite quote? Please, go for it. I love them. I'm reading Samantha Power's book, uh -huh. and she says, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. Mm. Right. Right, and so much of social media is straight outside, and a lot of not even real outside. <laughs> Photoshopped outside. This is my other quote I overuse, focusing on the false self is the death of happiness. Um, and I see, you know, I, hopefully we are mostly like more mature than the young adults that I see just like focusing on things that are just not important, you know, and spending so much energy there. No, just before you get you going, know, I was going to ask, I don't know if you saw the um, photography exhibit by, it's Eric, and I can't, I know his last name starts with a P, I think, I don't know if anyone saw it, but it was all these photos done in black and white, mm. where they took, like, kind of our strange and lonely world, mm. and it was just, like, you know, a couple in bed with their back together, you know, what he did was he removed the phones. So you don't yeah. notice that the phones are removed at first until you kind of like realize that they've removed the phones and just people sitting around the dinner table. Like that body positions, that being on technology. Oh, we have to find that. Google search photography exhibit removed phone. You should get it. His name was Eric. I'm sure it's Eric. And I think his last name started with a P, but I can't exactly remember his last name. But um, it would be great for you to install. Well, and especially again as a somatic psychologist, I love you know I love noticing. To her point, when my husband and I are at like a boba tea shop and we're waiting for our tea to come and we want to check on our family member, and we're like, oh, I need to touch each other while we're on the phone. So that we are connected physically, even though we are maybe mentally not with him at that moment, and at least physically touching his knee or whatever, so that we're still together in that. I love that. In that escape. Thank you. Did you find the name? Eric Pickerskill. Pickerskill. Yeah. How do you spell? Where are you saying? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Picker, like P I C K E R. And then S, Pickers, Gill, G-I-L-L. -L. Cool. Thank you. I'm excited to check that out, right? And just sort of bringing that body awareness. I mean, that's, so the power of somatics is just noticing how you are in your body in the world brings all sorts of information. Um, so I love, yeah, thinking about that with the phone, right? Oh, I mean, it's just so much. Right, and we are, we're seeing so much more anxiety and 
you know, I know how it feels to juggle the things I'm jugging, juggling, and our young adults add that exponentially, right? The, the amount of stuff sometimes I'll have a client in one session, and we actually just notice what's coming in. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like over and over and over again, and most of it is drivel, like literally actually a picture of an elbow, right? But it, that's coming at you because they have to keep their streak or whatever it is they're doing. Um, so it, it's, it's intense. It's super important to be, ta you know, if you have young people, be talking to them about it. And the antidote is mindfulness. I mean, really, truly, because, you know, and especially, and many of you know, you know, I, I have a number of kind of soapboxes. Another big one is porn, because that's our sex ed these days. Whether you want it to be or not, it is. And that's, that could be a different salon. <laughs> um, but it, it's sad, actually. It, it's, no, it's really changing the shape of, you know, sexuality and, and relationships. And it's so important to talk to young adults about it earlier than you probably think. Um, and not in a negative way. It's actually really normal to be curious about naked bodies and sex. And, but understanding kind of how you explore that is really important. And the internet is a really dangerous place to do it. But that's where they're going, you know. So how do you do it in a healthy way? Um, so just bringing awareness, bringing mindfulness um, is really the key. That awareness equals choice. <laughs> I liked this one. I, don't, I just like that quote too. Just presence is the best present. And uh, you know, I really appreciate T Tiffany Schlaine for this invitation to try the technology Shabbat. And again, there's no one size fits all. A lot of this is about just simply getting curious. And you know, for me, truthfully, like I try not to do a lot of emailing and that kind of stuff. And so it's often the end of the day in the bed when I check things, but. It, that works for me and then I put it away and whatever. And then there's other people where I know like the phone cannot even go in the bedroom, right? It's really about kind of figuring out what rhythm works for you and just getting curious and being honest, you know? And maybe, you know, if you're in a family and a partnership, I think also asking for feedback, right? Like you, know, you may think this is working for you, but also talking to the people that you're around and asking the question, like how, how, how is this working for our family, for us? I love the idea of staying connected physically. That's a cool one. So this is going to be heavy. <laughs> but I, I want to pass around these Labradorite rocks. I have big ones and small ones. Feel free, yeah, feel free to take, right, so powerful. So feel free to take a big one or a small one or, or one of each. I think there's enough. Um, but. I'll, I'll get this. So labradorite is a stone that I've been drawn to since I was a teenager. Um, I was actually, as I was putting on my necklace, I actually made this in college. It's labradorite. And for me, labradorite represents life. Life is shiny and dark. And kind of as we spoke to at the beginning, it's often actually in the most challenging times that we get the most clear on what matters, that we tap into gifts, that we tap into strengths. And you never wish challenges or hard times on anyone. And yet, life is life, and they come. And I think one of the biggest blessings I've gotten by doing the work I do and getting to sit with people uh, in often the darkest times is over and over again, I'm so inspired to see that that's where we learn and grow. That's where a gift shows up that we never would have expected. And sometimes it takes a while. Um, but I offer this rock as an invitation to remember that. Because for me, the rock, it's kind of embodied right there. Like you can look at it and just say, oh, there's a gray rock. Or you can turn it and see the sparkle and the magic. And I think one of the things for me in doing the work that I do is I have to really consciously continue to look for the sparkle. It's an active practice for me. And many of you know I, I actually put on sparkles every morning. So you show me, you'll see me at pickup and I haven't showered or this or that. I've probably brushed my teeth and put on my sparkles because they sit next to, you know, my wedding ring and my contacts. And um, again, you know, for me it's super important to focus on that. Um, and it allows me, I think, to be with people in these darker places. 
and invitation to kind of create your own practice, whatever it is, that kind of helps you, especially in hard times, look for the sparkle, look for the gift, look for the learning. And uh, throughout kind of my life, I think in the West, we're, we tend to pull things apart and dichotomize, you know, good, bad, mind, body, uh, you know, anger, joy. And, and one thing I've learned is that it, it's all interconnected um, and that pulling it apart is actually not that helpful, but really honoring the interconnection and looking at, you know, yes, this is super challenging and yet, you know, Where's the growth? Where's the edge? Where's the, you know, I, uh, another quote I say is, you know, it's often at the edge where we get the best views, right? That place that's hard to kind of look out over. Um, so invitation in this moment to think about a recent challenge, big or small, something that's happened in your life that's difficult, that's dark, that's challenging. And just for a second kind of make space Honor that you're going through that or you went through it. Honor that it was difficult. And then drop underneath it and just ask the question, was there a gift? Is there a learning? What do you want to hang on to, take with you? That, that's actually, you know, so you went through this challenge. There might be aspects of it that you want to forget forever, right? <laughs> Exhale. Um, but what do you want to stay connected to? What's the shiny? What do you want to bring with you? And, and one might not come forward yet, and that's fine. Just making space for that, right? For sure. And then all coming kind of back to the room when you're ready. And again, invitation. Anyone want to share what came forward? Compassion, Compassion for other people. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm gonna go visit my dad right after this salon and tell my Thanks, Kathleen. Well, you know, so I feel like actually the one came for me was this Jane getting <laughs> run over this week <laughs> and having to go to the hospital on a neck board and an ambulance and just like, oh, it was just horrible thinking about her in pain and worse. And um, the gift was such a reminder to tell people I love them, right? Anyone else? Yeah. Um, a bunch of us probably in the street have a friend who just was in a biking accident yesterday, and she's going to be OK. But she posted a picture of herself with the good use of technology. Um, and <laughs> one of, and got all the support, right, immediately. And um, I was thinking how she looked so peaceful, even though she was in the hospital, she still had this brightness, this sort of sparkle about her, even though she looked like had blood on her. And one woman wrote that, and then all of us were saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the beauty of, she was still emotionally healthy, even though she was saying something not. It was we focused on her, her emotional health. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I just want to share with you that um, I took two walks. I'm so inspired by this. And my niece is um, is in treatment for an eating disorder. And she's really at the edge and doesn't see the shiny. And I'm going to forward one of my rocks to her and explain the meaning behind the shiny and the dark. And she'll find it. Yeah. So thank you. Yay. Well, so take another one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, um, and, and one of my specialties is eating disorders, um, which is a really tough one, especially anorexia, you know, where the, basically the brain's not working, it's starved, it's really tough. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, over and over again, I've just been honored to witness clients get into recovery and find the shiny and then have a relationship to nourishment. Right, it's an, everything's an opportunity. I don't know how old she is, but if she can figure this out now, right, truly figure out about nourishment, what really feeds you on all levels, you know, it will be a gift. But it's a scary one, so I send a lot of support her way. So I have a question. I just am curious, uh, with uh, neuroscience, um, 
emerging, you know, from the science of the neuroscience, and also the emerging science between our gut microbiome and our gut being our second brain. And really, in some cases, everyone now it looks like our gut's actually our first brain. Um, because I also have worked with a fair number of eating disorder girls, mainly. And, you know, I, I mean, I feel like in the last few years, I, I feel like there's this huge, I think there's a huge connection, especially in looking at what's happening within the brain, which actually has a strong connection to what's happening in our gut. And, um, and I think the, I'm just curious, like, where that intersects, because obviously, yeah, <laughs> but, but obviously the gut microbiome can heal much of what's happening in the brain. And that, that's what they're playing. Right. right, it's just interesting. I just didn't know where you are, you know, with this okay. and your patients yeah. and clients. I think it's so important. I'm super excited by it to learn more. I mean, actually what's coming forward in this moment is um, just that the, I had one client that I worked with for a long time and then he actually went on to go to art school in San Francisco and, and we weren't working together and then I later found out that he took his life um, very young. He was probably 20, late 20s when he took his life. And it's like one of my actually biggest professional regrets is I hadn't learned about that yet. And he got very sick after a trip, after he graduated high school, he went to Africa with his family and he got super sick and was on a ton of antibiotics. And we did a lot of work around that because it was very traumatic for him. But uh, like one of my biggest professional regrets is kind of not knowing more about that because I mean, he suffered from major, major depression um, and anxiety, but you know, he also, I'm, I'm sure his gut biome had been very impacted by all the antibiotics. So I think it's it's super fascinating. I definitely hold it. Definitely just like I thought like it's more yeah, yeah. yeah. And we know it's also that I did like, we know so little, right? I mean, really in many ways about the brain and the gut and it's so, you know, <laughs> that, um, it's so important. Yeah, it's, yeah. An, it's, an, it's interesting to follow, especially in the next few years. Yeah. Not to get a pitch for St. Francis Center, but I'm going to. Because <laughs> I work with the third graders, and we plant carrot seeds. And when they pull the carrots out of the ground, it's like a miracle. <laughs> because they didn't know carrots came out of the ground. <laughs> And then we just dust them off and eat them. Yeah. We don't wash yeah. them. Good. Yeah. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And they taste amazing, right? They taste different creature than the Costco. Just this itty bitty tiny seed becomes this big, and it's it's the miracle. Mm -hmm. And it's nourishing the gut by the I just I wanted to say something about your rocks because yes. you gave them the last time you yeah. were here, yeah. and um, I want you to know your gift continued to give. First of all, my original rock from you sits at my front door in a little tray so that I could look at it and try to find light on many dark days. Yes. Um, but also we went onto the website, and these are not inexpensive, so thank you. And my daughter purchased many to give as gifts because she loved your message that much and passed it on to probably 15 of her friends after the last one. So thank you for college students. Awesome. And we all keep it at our front door. Yeah. It's in a little tray and we look at it. So it's continued to give and make fun. I love that. Well, and, and yeah, yeah, invitation to take as many as you need and keep them in your pocket, in your car. You know, my clients definitely use it like that. And, you know, I, I was looking up actually this morning some of the, pro I mean, I know Labradorite, if you believe in um, crystal healing stuff, but it, it was actually, pro and I know I've always thought of Labradorite as the shiny dark thing. I knew it was protective and it helped you be your highest self. And, and then I got online to kind of look at it and it was, it was like, this is a stone that will help you become the person you are destined to be. It will cleanse your aura and work with your chakras to remove the bad habits, thoughts, and feelings that are preventing you from reaching your full potential. Wow. Right? I mean, I had, <laughs> right? Uh, um, you know, definitely kind of it, it considered helpful in treating depression and hopelessness. It is helpful in, in treating antisocial reckless and reckless and impulsive behavior. I was like, okay, it brings intuitive wisdom and takes away illusion. Have this, I mean, this is all I, all this morning. It was like, have a case of the blahs. Discover the magic of your spirit and its connection to the universe with lavadrite, the best stone for fighting off an existential crisis. <laughs> 
a rock star of mythical, mystical lore and ancient legends. The labyrinth crystal meaning can be traced back to the native peoples of icy Canada that believed the stone was created from frozen fire, a result of the northern lights. With its pearly hues that shimmer in a range of iridescent blues and greens, the labradorite crystal reminds us to keep it magical by linking us with the spiritual world, a dimension where anything is possible. So let's kind of close with that. If you are open to standing up, I feel like we need to hold hands. <laughs> Oh. oh, bring it. <laughs> Yay. Make a messy circle, right? You good? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, so beautiful. Just look around and reminder, there's kombucha that I learned to make at a soul food salon many years ago in the back. There's pomegranate hibiscus and jalapeno lime and then delicious, nutritious balls from Alana and Stacy. So please, and you know, I'd love to con continue conversation and your handouts have fun quotes and questions. So take those with you. And I, oh, and under your chair is a little gift to help you shift your body state, should you ever need to do that. Um, and it also will make your hair look amazing. I like to keep mine in the car. And, and actually, so it's one of those head scratchers. I meant to pull that out earlier and just as a, as a way of kind of reminding us the power of shifting your body state and tapping into pleasure. And um, I actually have done kind of psychological experiments using these over the years because when you do it on people, you kind of see how like in their body they are. And if you do that on a little kid, they freak out. Like they literally are like, ah, do it again, do it again, do it again. <laughs> And then almost everybody like smiles and is like, oh, that feels good. I had one person go, hmm. And I was like, wow, you know, like, but hopefully in, enjoy it, take it with you. And then look around for a moment at all these beautiful faces. I so appreciate each of you for showing up, for sharing, for being here, right? And being committed to being your best self and sharing that with the world. It's not easy. You know, there, there are days it's like breath by breath. It's okay. So I, I, I want to end by reminding you that you are sacred, worthy, luminous beings. You are love, and your love is forgiving. Yay. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so good.